Mount Amanum looks down upon Santa Clara Valley. It was given its name by our indigenous Ohlone people. It means resting place of the hummingbirds. Centuries later, the humming on that mountain was coming from a five-story high concrete radar tower. I'm Marilyn Priel. Stay with us and hear about the purpose and fate of that radar tower. My guest is co-founder and director of the Amanam Conservancy, Bassam Jabber. Welcome, Bassam. Thank you, Marilyn. It's so nice to have you here. Now, tell us why the radar tower was built on Mount Amanam. During the Cold War, uh, the Air Force decided to in install radar installations around the country and even around North America and Mount Amanam was chosen for the site of Almaden Air Force Station to provide air surveillance during the Cold War to detect any incoming enemy threat, usually in the form of a, a bomber coming in off the coast. So that sounds pretty critical. Yes, yeah, during the Cold War, uh, after we dropped two atomic bombs on Japan to end our involvement in that war, we quickly realized that that could happen to us. And so the country spent the modern day equivalent of billions and billions of dollars to build a vast air defense network of which Almaden Air Force Station was a node on that network of radar stations. Was it involved at all with the Moffett? Uh, no, Moffett uh, Air Force, uh, Moffett uh, Naval Air Station was Navy. You didn't coordinate with them or anything? No, there was no real coordination, mm -hmm. very little if any. Mm -hmm. Was this tower unique? There were 12 radars like the radar up at Mount Amanam. However, what made it unique was that it was the largest ground rotating radar that the Air Force used during the Cold War. Um, it was also one of the highest powered radars. So it was unique in design. Although there were 12 like it around the country of that specific model, Almaden's was a little bit more unique among amongst the others because the actual manufacturer of the radar chose to do their initial, you know, burn-in test, they, that's what they called it, um, at Almaden because it was a little easier to get to that site as opposed to the production model before it, which was up at Point Arena, California, which is really remote. Well, tell us about the air station there. There's quite a bit to tell yes. about all that went on. It was in operation for 22 years, from 1958 to 1980. Uh, at its peak, there was about 125 airmen and their families that lived up there, so a little over 200, 220 people that lived on the site at its peak. Uh, it was just like any other community down here. It had apartments and housing and barracks, and it had all the facilities you would see in any other military installation, such as recreational facilities and personnel and squadron headquarters and supply buildings. Uh, it was just a small little town up in the hill. Did they have a school there for the children? Or? They had everything but schools. Mm -hmm. the, the school children were bused back and forth to schools on the same blue Air Force bus that anybody who lived in the valley took, kind of like a shuttle, up to the site when they had to report for duty. Well, tell us about <coughs> the activities that took place at the station. It was round-the-clock air surveillance, so uh, crews sat on eight-hour shifts three times a day, three shifts a day, uh, 24 by 7, essentially watching scope screens and looking for any unidentified aircraft that was not part of the normal FAA flight plan. And if anything was deemed suspicious or faux, they would send up what was known as either, either a visual intercept, where a fighter jet would leave an Air Force base, to go take a look, um, or if the event came, they would send a rocket intercept to take out a bomber. That's so, pretty exciting. Yeah, rockets didn't come from Mount Amunum, though. They would have come from- Elsewhere. Uh, yeah, Army bases, mm -hmm. Nike missiles. Okay. Then uh, how was the valley below impacted by having a station up there? F physical impact, people could see the station, see the radar, and see it spinning. It was a visual um, 
piece of, or a visual sense of, of, of protection that they would see. They would hear it on TV and radio. People used to always say they would hear a zip or a blip mm -hmm. on the radio or television. Um, but from a, a, just a general sense of impact of, of, there was a sort of this blanket of protection that people knew that was there when that radar station kind was in operation. To them. It was comforting. Mm -hmm. A lot of people recalled uh, the day it closed. They felt sort of sad that there was no more you know, air defense, mm -hmm. but by that time there was mm -hmm. other defense uh, systems in place. How did it contribute to the well-being of the valley? Uh, did it bring extra, I guess, um, the people on the base would shop down in the valley and... Uh, oh yeah, the, the, the squadron, the 682nd Radar Squadron, which is the actual uh, unit that was assigned there, um, it wasn't just a bunch of people that just stayed up there and you know, frequently visited. They were actually part of the community. They contributed in community events, um, in fundraisers, they were part of the nearby community. Um, the, the rest of the valley became what we know as Silicon Valley. You know, that was the Valley of Hearts of Delight and mm -hmm. then Silicon Valley. So the service that was being provided up there, the actual air defense, enabled a lot of this valley to thrive into what we know it today. A lot of the, tech, you know, basically the technological powerhouse you know, that we are today, Silicon Valley. A lot of the companies that set up shop in the Bay Area uh, probably wouldn't have invested so much into this area if there wasn't adequate air defense. They would have gone further inland where bombers couldn't reach. Well, that's interesting. Now, um, and some of the people maybe didn't live on the base. Did any of them have housing yeah, off-site and yes, commute a number, to work? <laughs> yes, a number of airmen actually lived in houses down in the valley, either drove their own vehicles or took that blue Air Force bus at, from certain shuttle points. Um, there was a time when the, the, the barracks that were up on the site were no longer, um, you know, livable. They were getting pretty torn up from the weather on Mount Amunum, and a lot of the single airmen and airwomen were allowed to live in a adult-only um, apartment complex down uh, at the bottom of the hill, and they took the Air Force shuttle bus or drove their own vehicles to the top. They must have loved that. Yeah, but they, they were subject to routine inspection, just no. like you would if you were in the barracks up on the mm -hmm. site. So that was always interesting, I'm sure. Were there um, any notable people uh, up there that we would want to know about, uh, maybe commanders, or I'm not sure what you call an Air Force leader? <laughs> the commander was usually a rank of a major, and mm -hmm. in some cases, uh, in rare instances, a lieutenant colonel. But for the most part, it was a major. Um, Notable, like celebrity status, probably no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there weren't any. Um, commanders usually rotated out uh, of the station every two years, um, usually a little over two years, whereas a normal airman who was stationed there would have been there no more than like three to three and a half years at most. Um, and it was common that they rotated commanders out more frequently just to kind of keep everybody on their toes, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, would you want to share any special uh, stories about what went on up there or the people? There, there was many stories. Um, one of the things that the veterans uh, do is they send me a lot of the photos to be archived in, in what will someday. They know what you're doing, oh, yes. all the veterans. Yeah, they, they send the photos mm -hmm. and with every photo there's a story, um, fascinating mm -hmm. stories, so much more than I can Remember, I tell a lot of these on my presentations that I give every other month um, over in New Almaden. Um, well, give us your favorite. I think probably one of the more comical ones I heard was uh, one of the commanders used to get every month a, a, a bill for a bottle of Chanel Number no. 5 perfume. And he uh -oh. did not know why <laughs> he was getting this bill every month. And uh, one day a gentleman showed up at the main station gate where the air police, uh, security police, you know, greeted him. And uh, this person tried to, wanted to meet the commander. And they immediately smelled the Chanel number no. five and knew exactly what was, who he was. So they called the commander down and the commander came to the gate. And he said, why are you sending me this, this, uh, this Chanel bill, you know, every month? And he mm -hmm. says, I, I need this to, to keep the, uh, the radar uh, waves from the radar from hurting me. <laughs> it was kind what? of a funny story. Yeah, it was, was a joke or no? It wasn't. He <laughs> it was probably it? just somebody who wanted Chanel number. Five. I guess <laughs> it was kind of an interesting story. 
Um, that was more of the funnier stories. Um, the, a lot of other stories about the weather. The weather was always a factor up on Mount Amanam. It still is. Um, they would tell stories of um, driving up and down the road, like one guy would be driving and another airman would be sitting on the hood looking at the lane, the lane oh lines, God, and guiding the driver. It was, the fog was so thick. And such a narrow little winding road, too. Yes. Yeah. So that was exciting to go to work every day then, huh? To get there. If you didn't live up there and you had to travel up mm -hmm. and down, yeah, it was an mm -hmm. interesting commute, mm -hmm. if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. yeah. There was one uh, I heard at one of your lectures about the, one of the officers came back and a tribute was given to him uh, that I thought was quite, quite nice. There were, there were, well, there was many, I think, the, were you talking about the event that we had in October of last mm -hmm. year? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that person actually wasn't stationed at the site. The unique story behind that one was he was the sole survivor of a plane crash where <gasps> That's right. the commander That's right. of Almaden Air Force Station was the pilot of that plane who died in that crash. That what, was, can you tell us a little bit about that Yeah, it was May story? 4th, 1970. Uh, the commander of the site was Major Robert L. Robinson who um, was a decorated Vietnam pilot. And um, in order to maintain his flight status, he had to fly one more flight. And it was gonna fly a, uh, a transport plane out of Hamilton Field in Novato. One more flight. One more flight, flight, his last flight um, out of Novato. And that flight was scheduled to depart Hamilton and head for Spokane, Washington. And he was late to the runway because of weather, as we know. and. The last second, as the plane was taxiing towards the, the runway, um, he managed to pull up beside and they stopped and the reserve pilot got off and he got in and buckled in and they took off. And a few minutes later, the plane uh, had a, uh, a catastrophic structural failure, which um, then caused it to crash in the Sonoma Hills. And all of the 13, all 14 uh, people on board died except for one, which was uh, George Burke who was our guest that we had back in October, who came and, and uh, told that fascinating story, um, which was a very emotional story to, to, to tell. How many veterans have you had um, contact you since you've been trying to preserve all this? And we'll talk later about what you're doing to preserve it, yeah. but I was just wondering how many people have contacted you who were working up there? Quite a few. I, uh, I have a contact list that's over 250 people, ranging from military veterans to dependents, which mm -hmm. could have been a wife or a child that lived there while somebody was stationed there. Um, it, it's amazing to see uh, how many of the local veterans still live here in the Bay Area that basically called this place home after they got out of the Air Force. Um, I was quite surprised to see how many still live in the area. So. Wow, well, it's a good place to live, isn't it? Yeah, we love. <laughs> Well, uh, when and why did the station close? The station was declared excess in um, the latter part of 1978, and it took about a year and a half to wind down the closure. And there was a closing ceremony on March 29, 1980. Two days later, on April 1st, 1980, the site went officially offline. Um, the reason why sites like this went away were, was because uh, you know, initially with atomic weaponry, you had to fly in and drop it from a bomber. But as the technology of atomic weaponry progressed, so did the vehicle of delivery. So you no longer had to fly in and drop it. You can launch it from a rocket, uh, from a submarine or a ship out to sea. And eventually, like today, nuclear weapons can be delivered from a missile, an intercontinental ballistic missile. So a, a radar that was 250 mile radius on the ground a 250-mile radius radar on the ground was essentially uh, inadequate for detecting a missile. It would have been too late for a missile. These, these radar stations were designed to detect bombers. And so if a, satellites had to go up in space to keep up with the, the technological advancements in nuclear delivery. Well, um, what was it like being a little boy? Because I know you, that you're trying to preserve all this because you grew up in the area. How did you feel just personally having the station up there? Because little boys like things like that, don't they? Yeah, <laughs> I actually have an engineering degree, so that kind of stuff fascinated me. Um, you know, when I, I grew up in this area, I, I'm a, a native of this area, born and raised, and you don't really take 
notice of your surroundings mm. until you kind of get your driver's license and you start exploring. And I remember seeing it up on the hill and would ask my father about it, who was in the Army, and he would tell me it's a radar station. Um, I found it pretty fascinating back then, didn't really know much more about it. Um, and it wasn't until I kind of moved closer towards the, the South Bay, you know, south, you know, southern part of the valley that I started seeing it every day and noticing and mm -hmm. sort of took interest in it. And it, to me, it means home whenever I see it, whenever I look up at, at Mount Amunum and see that identifiable structure up there, at, you know, the radar tower that is. It, it means a piece of history and a piece of home and a piece of our surroundings that is very identifiable. A part of the valley? Yes. Santa yeah. Clara. Well, what happened to the site then after they closed it down? It essentially remained shuttered for about six years until it was sold to uh, an open space district agency that purchased the land um, during that time before they took it over and when it was, the military left, it was essentially in caretaker status. They were trying to find someone to purchase the property. Now, why did you, why does it mean so much to you to become involved in all this and preserving the actual radar tower and other people as well? I guess it's my way of giving back to the community, getting involved and being a part of that, um, just to know that I was a part of saving a piece of history that's part of home. Um, I don't know what compelled me to stay so involved in it, um, I think a lot of it had to do with the relationships that I had made with all the, the veterans who served and lived up there, um, who wanted their stories told, who wanted their history to be there, something to be there. Um, when I learned that the agency that owns it was going to open the site to the public, uh, I thought it was great. You know, everyone's going to get a chance to, to visit this place and see the magnificent views and learn about the military history and see that, that structure up there, you know, enjoy that tangible piece of history. But when I heard that that structure was destined to be demolished, I guess you can say I stepped up being involved. You certainly did. Yeah. Well, what was the point of demolishing it? Why did well, they think they needed to do that? Well, the agency that owns the site is an open space district. And by the nature of their name, they're an open space district. Mm -hmm. They don't do buildings. Mm -hmm. We understand that. They, they don't do historic preservation. Um, we get that, but I think when you have something that qualifies for that level of status, something that um, the, the, the vast majority of the valley was very outspoken and, and emotional about wanting to, to still be there, um, it, it was worth a shot, right? We had to go for it. What was the first thing you did to become actually organizing um, these efforts into something that would grow? First thing I did was I went to the Historical Heritage Commission of the Santa Clara County and asked them what needs to be done to get this structure designated historic, to get some demolition protection. Uh, there was a process to follow and we followed that process and I commissioned a county approved architectural historian to do a report on the radar tower. And shortly thereafter, the open space district that owns the tower uh, decided to delay their decision on the fate of the tower and essentially give the public five years to go and raise the funds to preserve and save it. And um, in order to do that, uh, we had to form a nonprofit. So myself and five others formed what was known as the Amunum, what is known as the Amunum Conservancy, which is a 501c3 nonprofit that's uh, sole mission was to raise the funds to, uh, and the awareness to preserve and keep this tower. Um, in perpetuity, you know, with maintenance costs. Along that process, we still continued on with the county in terms of the historical designation. And we were successful in that um, in May of last year of 2016, we did um, get a unanimous vote from the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors to list the structure on what's known as the Heritage Resource Inventory, which essentially gives it some historic designation within the county. So. So um, then the parks, uh, the open space uh, people are okay with having it off on the side out there. Shortly after the designation at the county, the open space district board of directors then voted to uh, adopt what's known as the retain and seal option, okay. which was to retain the tower and seal it. No public entry, just 
to have it up there in a sealed state, uh, which is really the uh, the option that we were trying to get them to take on mm -hmm. when they started that five year process. They didn't. They were worried about maintaining it. So then, who who will actually maintain it and say keep it painted or whatever has to be done? Yeah, that's a great question. So part of the funds that we were uh, raising also go towards maintenance. Um, now that the structure is going to be officially retained and sealed, um, the Open Space District has indicated that because it's their property, it's their structure, that they will maintain the tower and, uh, in, in an ongoing effort. Well, that worked out very well, didn't it? For it you? did, and, yeah. and mm -hmm. the Conservancy, you know, we've raised some funds and we're still here as a funding mm -hmm. partner and um, we're certainly you know, more than willing to fund repairs to the tower. That was our mission, still is our mission. And we are still in a fundraising state. Now, how many years have you been involved in this? My interest began probably 11 years ago, uh, but actively involved, I'd say probably a good seven. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not like a full-time job, it's something that I just do on the side, but um, it, it's great to be a part of that, and that's why I stayed involved in it. Well, you give so many lectures, uh, information lectures and fundraising lectures. It must take a lot of your time. The, the, the presentations, uh, the slideshow presentations that I give, uh, usually every other month in New Almaden at the Quicksilver Mining Museum, which is hosted by Santa Clara County Parks. And uh, those are always a big hit. They always, we always book them out, fill up the room. Um, they're great because people get to come and see that fascinating history mm -hmm. from start to finish and learn about that history. Um, and hopefully that, that I guess you can say, presentation series will, will move up to the hill and essentially be a, a walking tour, you know, mm -hmm. on the site. Would you ever be involved up there and in, in doing on-site? Uh... I certainly hope so. I certainly mm -hmm. hope that the Open Space District will, will include me in that aspect of it. Um, it, of course, I can always just have my own. Now, the, once the site's open to the public, and I can always just take a group up there as long as I get. You, you know, could do that. Absolutely, as long okay. as I get the proper permit from the district. Mm -hmm. If it's a group that's larger than 20 or so people. But the slides, you know, uh, showing the the station and everything when it was operating, are really interesting. If you could have yeah. some little place to show the slides or. Yeah, I, well, I, I can have some handouts that we'll be passing around. One of the things that I was going to revisit was the, the topic of a photo book, a photo history book, mm -hmm. which is something I actually started to try to do prior to the presentations. Um, it's hard to, to write a book like that when you have so many great photos and you have to decide which ones you want to put in it, uh, and then you get more you know, provided to you by, by other veterans that I made contact mm -hmm. with. And, it's impossible to have any photos on the tower itself where people could just see it as they're walking around. That would be great. There's no plans for that. There mm -hmm. are a couple of interpretive display panels that will be up on the site. There's actually going to be several of those panels, um, each one telling the story of Native American history, natural history, and military history. There's going to be actually a couple of those that are specific to the former Almaden Air Force Station and the military presence on the hill. And those interpretive panels will have photos and, and information and, and stories and, and just a lot of information that you would normally see you know, in, a, in a setting like that. I think that would really enhance the, the site by having all the historical. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great that you would be able to see not only a picture of what was up there, but now you'll still be able to see the radar tower, which will mm. still be up there. That's even better. Well, how can other people help with this if they, they're inspired by what you're doing and hearing, uh, hearing about it? What can they do? Being involved can be as easy as just um, being there, sharing. Uh, you know, social media was a valuable tool for us. But by far, you know, the Umanum Conservancy will still remain as a fundraising entity. Um, we are a 501c3 and donations are IRS tax deductible. Uh, but more importantly, if you work for a corporation that does matching uh, oh. in any percentage, um, they usually require that it be a 501c3, hence why we'll stay on um, the open space district is not a 501c3. They are, you can do tax deductible donations to them, but it's not 501c3, so matching uh, won't occur if your corporate employer does matching. Have you had very many Silicon Valley companies uh 
helping you out? We have, and we still continue to, to fundraise more, and we hope to get more. So yeah, there's a lot of interest there. A lot of the companies that are around here are companies that actually developed components and equipment for the military, specifically for sites like Almaden Air Force Station. Well, you worked very hard to save this part of our history, and congratulations on your success. Thank you. And uh, I wish you the best with your further endeavors with it. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thanks for coming. I always wondered what that thing was up on Mount Elmenum. Yeah, now you'll get to see it and <laughs> mm -hmm. touch it. Mm -hmm. We're happy you joined us. We look forward to having you next time. Goodbye for now.